Welcome back to The Extract in the Best Wines Media Tasting Room. And when it rains, it pours. The dignitaries are flowing in like hot lava. Today, we have the great Michael... Mospoka. Michael... Mospoka. Easy for him to say. I call him Mickey. Um, a, lot of, well, a lot of his friends call him Mickey. A few folks call him Mickey, right? Yeah. Are we allowed to call him Mickey today? Is that cool? Mickey, or, that's cool. Or Mr... Most poker. We could do that too instead. <laughs> anyway, uh, Michael or Mickey is uh, flat out uh, one of the greatest uh, white wine producers in the world. Uh, I'm just going to cut right to the chase. You are a rock star. I love your wines. You're one of the greatest producers in the world. Is that okay to say that? I'm, I'm not completely sure about yeah. this. But I, I, you know, a, a few people have said it. He's being very modest. Um, welcome. Sincere welcome, welcome. This is, uh, this is goosebump stuff for us here uh, in the Tasty Room because we're such big fans of your wines. And, and what's been really great is we've been big fans since the start. You purchased the property when? In 1990... 1996, 1996. I took, took over responsibility there. Yeah, yeah, took over responsibility. And uh, you had some help, right, at the time? Uh, well... Uh, my 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 dear friend uh, Willy Brunnenmeier is also involved in, in, yeah. in the project, um, and uh, so we 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 started together. Um, but but Goldsberg and and Brunnenmeier, you know, there there are some there they're fantastic estates, both in their way, uh, and uh, but Brunnenmeier stayed much much. More based on the personality of Willy, mm -hmm. uh, Goebbelsberg uh, is uh, based on the uh, on the history and and on the tradition uh, and on the culture of of, of Austrian winemaking. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a much more uh, much more history based um, uh, property. Were you in the wine business before? No, I'm I'm, I'm originating from uh, from the hotel and restaurant trade myself. Okay. So my my family runs a small relationship hotel. In the skiing areas of Austria, and and uh, when my brother took over the family business, I was free to do something else. And my my father was the co-founder of the first Austrian sommelier association. And, wow! And uh, so f wine was always an important issue in our family life. So I decided to to go into the wine growing areas. I made my apprenticeship, uh, started from a stretch, and and. I uh, was looking for a place where I could follow my own ideas. Right. And uh, it was, yeah, some say it was a coincidence, it was good luck. Uh, some say it was higher will. Good idea, oh Lord. Of course it's a good idea. So, <laughs> so, uh, so basically in 1996, I, I had the chance to take over the responsibility of of the heritage of, of Goebbelsberg. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you, you know, because to us Americans, we weren't familiar with the Goebbelsberg estate until it, it, it shot to prominence uh, under your, your, your guidance. Now, but there was a history with the estate prior, correct? Mm -hmm. within, within Austria, it was very mm -hmm. well known. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was a little bit of the history with the mm -hmm. estate? Well, Goldsberg is, is in fact, it's, it's one of the oldest estates today in Austria. Uh, we, we are looking back to documented history back to the 12th century. And, and the history of the estate is, is connected to, to a Cistercian monastery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Cistercians are originating from, from Burgundy and in the 11th and 12th century, they, they were spreading all over Europe. One of, them, one of the, those monasteries was founded in our area. And the monks got the first vineyard in 1171. Mm -hmm. So since then, we do have the written documentation on the whole development of the estate. The, the roster of vineyards that the estate holds uh, is enviable. These are owned properties, right? These are mm. owned parcels, and these yeah. it's enviable. Uh, was this was this roster of estates gathered or vineyards gathered through a number of years? Were they already in place when you had uh, when you had took over uh, running the estate, or what was the situation there? Well, uh, looking to to, um, to to the collection of vineyards. Uh, it, it's easy to be said that it's a collection, of, you know, that that developed over the past 800 years, yeah. and and uh, so uh, you know, b the monks and the monastery had uh, had been uh, in par parallel to the overall Austrian development. 
uh, a big impact in the, in, in, in the development of the, of the overall area. Mm -hmm. So we, we're looking today at some of the really best vineyard sites. Uh, Unbelievable. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's a really a great tool to work today and, and it's a great heritage to look after, after that collection. I would say you're lucky, but I think you're kind of like smart. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, okay, in the glass right now, I have the, uh, the 2012 Riesling Tradition, mm -hmm. which I think this is one of the coolest new projects, new old projects mm -hmm. happening in Austria right now. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the, the roots of the Tradition project, which you started. Well, the, the beginning of that project uh, uh, is connected when we took over, when we took over Goebbelsberg uh, in, uh, in the late 90s and we had a, a series of tastings out of our library. Uh, we have a library that, that is going back to, to the 40s. And uh, at one of these occasions, we, when we were tasting uh, 30, 40, 50 year old Gruners and Rieslings, uh, we had a discussion going on, on, well, it would be interesting to know how these wines tasted when they were young. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, if, if you want to know how these wines tasted when they were young, it you need you need to know how these wines were made. Right. So um, beside that, I, I started to occupy on, on the history of the estate. I also started to occupy on the history of, of winemaking. Uh, so running after the question, how was wine made during Greek Roman times, uh, Middle Ages, 17th, 18th, 19th century, and all the developments that were following and have been leading to. To, to the moment when we start to talk about modern winemaking. And I, I, find, uh, I, I, I find it particularly interesting to, to look at the time between 1800 and 1850, uh, because this, this period of, of, of winemaking is, is marking on, on one side 2,000 years of empirical knowledge of winemaking on one side. On the other side, around 1850, it's, uh, it's the time uh, when suddenly the, the impact of, uh, of the Industrial Revolution is, right, is starting right. to get viral. And, uh, you know, it's the time of the first filtration machines, the first pumping machines. It's a time when, uh, when, when, when the, the craftsmanship side of the winemakers are starting, is starting to change. And it's a, it's, a, it's a development over the next 100, 150 years that, that slowly has been leading actually to, to the point where we stand nowadays. And I think the, the particularly interesting thing uh, ab about all these developments is that it's not only the craftsmanship side that started, that's been starting to change, uh, beside that and parallel to that, also our the attitudes towards mm. wine and uh, the reflections on wine have been starting to change in the same way. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it's, it's leading somehow to the question on, you know, what, what, comes, what comes first. Is it, is it the things that we're doing that are defining our philosophies on things, or it's the philosophy that's defining uh, the things that we are doing? In, 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 in the 19th century, a winemaker had a completely different idea on his wines, because in these days, uh, he had the Im image that for every wine you have a certain ideal or mature condition. And my responsibility as a winemaker is to transfer the wine from its embryonical state now into this ideal or mature condition. Right. So here we're not talking about preservation of aroma components, we're talking about the development process. Putting the wine on a path. In a way, in a path. Uh, and basically, they, they've been comparing wine to, to the human beings. They mm -hmm. said, wine is like us. Right. And as we humans have to undergo certain developments until we are grown-ups, mm. also wine has to undergo certain developments. And as we have to breathe to do all this, also wine has to breathe. <laughs> so, you, you see, this, this, yes. this, 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 image, this, this, this image has been, has been, has been leading to, uh, to the practice that they that they were trying to let the wine breathe yeah. due to wrecking processes so that the wine can make now his next step of his development. Right, so this, this is Riesling done in a more aerobic fashion as opposed to an anaerobic fashion. Yeah, uh, that's, that's true. Uh, also connected here is also the role of, of lees, for example. Uh, whereas in, in the modern winemaking, where we are trying to protect our aroma components, 
we are very eager to leave the wines on a, a very long time on the leaves, something that you probably have heard mm -hmm. hundreds of times, yeah. long lees contact, uh, right. batonnage and, yeah, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, lees is a is a is a is a reductive environment. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's why we are doing it because we want to protect our aroma components. Right, right. Two hundred years ago, it was just the opposite. Lees was seen as as the, as the source of all my troubles. Right. Evil. <laughs> Evil. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so basically, naturally, they were going off the lees as fast as possible. Possible. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Fascinating. So with every racking process, they, they have been letting the wine breathe from one side, but they have been going off the leaves as fast as possible. Right. You have to imagine there was no filtration. So yeah. the wines needed to be clear at a certain stage. Right, right. And, and uh, so here we're looking to a much more, a much more oxidative way of, of, of treatment, of, of, of winemaking. Uh, which you also find, if you're looking to, to the very traditional ways of winemaking, uh, looking to Madeira, looking to Sherry, mm -hmm. uh, looking to the Jura, for example. They're all the, the very traditional ways of winemaking. They were always connected somehow to oxidative ways yeah, yeah. Uh, of treatment. This, but this wine is so, it's, it's so quietly focused. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's just as riveting as an example that's treated in a reductive fashion. Mm -hmm. but, but instead there's, there's amplitude mm -hmm. and roundness, mm -hmm. but still focus mm -hmm. and precision mm -hmm. in the wine. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, uh, what you probably also feel is that in comparison to 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 our modern made wines uh, here, especially here on the mid palate, mm -hmm. you feel uh, much more here the, the mid palate, uh, which is uh, originating actually uh, from the fact that when uh, when you when you're pressing the grapes, uh, we you you're not going through the step of sedimentation. Which is leading to a little bit higher content of sediments uh, during the fermentation process, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that is leading to a little bit more higher uh, phenolic and tannin components right, after right. the fermentation. But due to the oxidative way, um, you're balancing the phenolic components out, and this is this is what you what, what you feel here on on, on the mid palate. This guy's a lot smarter than me. I'm going to be perfectly blunt. <laughs> um, <laughs> Michael, this is pretty amazing. Um, you know, and but you know, and, but you know, the thing is, we we hooked up with with Michael's wines, you know, throughout the whole process from the start, and uh, and we just watched him grow as a vintner, as a proprietor, as a caretaker mm. of the Schloss Goblesberg, and and the work you're doing nowadays is miraculous. Uh, I truly think you're one of the best white wine making estates in the world, and uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, the talk shop, yeah. unbelievable. Hope you guys got all that. There's like some serious knowledge being dropped right now. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. All right, cheers. All right, cheers. Mm -hmm.